Hello again, everyone, and welcome back to Dark Souls 2. Today is the day you've all been dreading. Well, I've been dreading. And we are going to be plunging our way deep, deep, deep down into the gutter. <sighs> the lovely, lovely gutter. I'm going to make a quick stop by Shalquar to get the ring. But, uh, what, what is there to say about the gutter? I... It's so terrible. I hate it so much. It's not even that it's a poorly designed level, because it, it really is. Like, from an objective standpoint, how they fit the level together, and how they distribute the loot, and the kind of enemies that they set up throughout the area. It's all really clever, and it's really well designed. And from a gameplay standpoint, it really should be great, but I just hate it so much. The darkness mechanic, I don't like, just because they kind of worked how they wanted to implement that by first off I don't support the idea of taking away the character's left hand I think that the character should be able to use whatever equipment he wants and if that includes a shield on the left hand or a catalyst or whatever I think you should be able to just leave the character with that you can have other sorts of ways of punishing the character for in order to like pay for the convenience of having lighting but the idea of actually taking away the functionality of the character itself is just something I don't agree with and beyond that there's the matter of it's not just a lighting mechanic which honestly doesn't work very well I just have a compulsion to light up all the sconces down there in the gutter but as well it's a matter of the level is so sprawling and vertical which again is something that really should be praised it's just really frustrating to deal with from a player's perspective like if I had to say I would honestly state that the gutter is one of the better level designs in all of Dark Souls 2 but at the same time it doesn't make me want to play it every time I'm like oh, I have to go back down to the gutter again and it's just it just really makes me sad because I don't like to play it, but I can recognize that it's good. It's it's a lot like Blight Town combined with some of the aspects of the Valley of Defilement from De Demon Souls and the original Dark Souls combined. In that it's got those very vertical sections. Not so much the swamp portions, but the ramparts. It, it's really a distilled version of the ramparts that pervaded both of those levels in Dark Souls and Demon Souls. And I, I really like how FromSoft keeps up with certain themes. Certain areas and motifs just pervade their game designs. Again, like the swamp levels, the... whatchamacallit? Which actually made its way into Earth and Peak in a manner of speaking, but also the ramparts that and the really rickety building design that went into god the sprinting attack on this is horrible but the uh, rickety buildings that went into the gutter and blight town and the valley of defilement and how they all kinda come together in one really thematic style that's that's one of the best things about FromSoft and their Souls games <sighs> but yeah the gutter it's it's a terrible level to play through, but honestly, it's really well designed. And it just really makes me th wish that I was playing... It's one of those moments where I really wish I was playing Dark Souls 1, because Blight Town, while I know a lot of people actually really hate it, I think Blight Town was one of the best levels in Dark Souls 1, and it was always a joy to clear through. Not only was it one of those levels that you can grab all the loot in one solid clear, but it was very maze-like. It had all these twists and turns and vertical sections that combined together to make a really fleshed-out level that was always a pleasure to run through. Sure, the poison was a little bit annoying. Some of the uh, bottlenecks were absolutely vicious, but I always enjoyed my time spent in Blight Town. I always looked forward to when I was really ready to clear through there again and I kinda miss it because the gutter 
while it replaces the ramparts, it's the kind of carrying the torch of Blight Town from Dark Souls 1. It doesn't have the same feel. It's so dark, the torches aren't leading you anywhere. It feels a little bit disjointed in comparison, and it is nowhere near as easy to clear through all in one go. It's, it is the evolution of the ramparts of Blight Town, but it's kind of lost the soul of the thing, even though, again, it is technically impressive. I just... It makes me long for the days of yore when Blight Town was always such fun to go through and everyone else was busy complaining about frame rate issues. Because at the time that I was first getting into Dark Souls, and honestly most of my experience with Dark Souls, I actually couldn't really spot differences in frame rates. Especially because I played it all on console and then moved to PC and never really bothered grabbing DS Fix. I'm surprised I made that jump. That's actually kind of a difficult jump. But the real standout difference finally hit me since I've been playing Dark Souls 2 on PC for so long. Trying to go back to the console version of Dark Souls 2 is just absolutely horrible. It really highlights the difference between frame rates. And I just can't give up this silky smooth 60 FPS. This encounter it was a little bit strange in that it was nerfed a little bit after the game was relief, released, but I never really understood why. I, I never had a problem with this encounter. All of those enemies stagger incredibly easily, and if you couldn't kill one of the hollows in one hit, then two hits almost guaranteed would suffice because they have ridiculously low defenses. The, the way they were nerfed was that they used to have about 300 hit points for each of the hollows, but in the nerf they reduced that to about 100 or 80, somewhere around there, hit points, and that's just one of the changes that I never really felt was justified, because, again, they weren't dangerous in the first place as long as you could hit them, and reducing their hit points isn't going to make hitting them any easier. All that does is guarantee you the kill when you hit them with anything stronger than your fists. So. That's one of the changes, the nerfs to the game, that I don't really understand and kind of disagree with. Just the idea that they reduce the health bars of those unstable hollows. That's just, just in case. Come on down. And that's a full clear of the Tomb of the Saints. That's one of the really fun levels in this game, not only because it is just a really straight clear, but also because it's entirely optional, it's got that PvP focus, you can be dragged into another world, and the fact, and I think this is the really big thing that draws me to it, the fact that you don't suffer if you don't want to engage in PvP. With invasions throughout the world, uh, you're being thrust into PvP against your, wo your will, and you suffer the punishments of losing in PvP, in that you... Uh, are no longer... I mean, you're one step further to hollowing, you have to go pick up your blood, your blood stain, and you've lost all that progress. In the Tomb of the Saints, none of that's the case. The only uh, corollary there is that you're not PvPing willingly, you're still being thrust into someone else's world, but at the same time, you've got nothing to risk. If you want, you can just sacrifice yourself on the NPCs right as you get summoned in, at absolutely no cost to you. There's been no change in how you're going to play through the game, it's just a minor inconvenience, and you can just carry on your merry way. Whereas, if you have an invader, uh, that, that really is a major inconvenience because it's ruining part of your game. You're getting dragged into an event that you didn't want to partake in, and now someone's trying to kill you, and they don't really suffer anything if they lose, so there's the risk reward is really on the wrong foot, I think. And that's just something that I really dislike seeing. So all of the Rat Covenant invasions I'm a big fan of. I really like the changes they made there. I kind of also like the uh Dragon Covenant in that it gives both the invader not the invader, but both the Phantom and the 
host, the ability to Estus, it kind of puts you all on a level playing field. So you can just play at a very equal level. But at the same time, it's one of those really... It still puts the host at a disadvantage in that now they're perfectly equal, but the host is still risking something. The host is the human one. If they die, they have to either sacrifice their ring breaking or use a human effigy to human back up. The only way around that is playing hollow, at which point you're sacrificing a large portion of your health bar. So it's a little bit imperfect. With the Rat Covenant, it's you summoning them into your world. You're both on equal footing in that you're risking something, but at the same time you have the advantage of the NPCs and traps that you've set up. So it's just the ideal PvP setup, in my opinion. Like, I would say that any sort of encounter you're going to have in the Rat Covenant is going to be a better encounter than any other sorts of PvP setups you can get. The possible exceptions being the arenas for both the Brotherhood of Blood and the Blue Sentinels. But that's just because it's... Oh, there's Melinda. That's only really an issue because everyone's already agreeing to come together in PvP, and everyone's already kitted out for PvP with nothing to... There's no risk, it's purely reward. Arguably, you could say that's not entirely true because you're risking your rank dropping if you're trying to gain ranks in the Covenant, but honestly, at that point, you're just doing it for the rewards and not really doing it for the PvP, so you can't complain too terribly much. Like I said earlier, I absolutely feel compelled to full clear this area and light up as many sconces as I can, so it takes several trips through the gutter in order to set that up properly. You've got to come back to the start at least like once or twice in order to make sure you grab all the side loot. And there's at least one point in the level where you have to make a choice whether you want to get one piece of loot or another. And while it's very simple because one of them is just a flame butterfly, it's still so frustrating because you, you, you literally cannot grab both of the items. There's just no way it isn't allowed. They're completely divergent paths. I can ignore this guy, but it doesn't look like he wants to let me up the ladder, so probably going to kill him anyways. I didn't get a chance to speak about it the first time, but these are the enemies, the dogs, that have the really broken hitbox animation. Uh, the bite is a little bit better than their other attack in that it takes a little bit longer to come out, though it is still pretty broken in how fast it comes out and how guaranteed the damage is. But their swipe that they have with their paw is completely broken. Like, there can be no defending it. There's no way to say that it's not. Uh, because no matter what happens, the moment they start the animation, if you're in range, you're going to take the damage. Doesn't matter if you kill it the exact second it starts the animation. If that animation triggered at all, the damage from the paw swipe is coming out, and you're going to take it to the face if you're within range. And that's just terrible, terrible mechanics to have in your game. You want to reward the player for uh, using predictive combat, for attacking the enemy before they're being attacked, before they're in risk, and to set it up so that the enemy gets their damage off so long as they've started the animation is just a terrible, terrible decision. It's really unfair, and there's almost no counterplay. Like, there's no... Oh, goodness. You can see that the hitbox there is just ridiculous. I was behind it and to the right, and it still swung and struck me when I was really out of range. <sighs> it's a little bit of frustrating enemy. That's another reason why the gutter doesn't quite live up to the legacy of Blight Town for me. So, it's just another gripe in the series of gripes that I have with this area, but again, I, I really do like it. There's so much that it does right, 
Like the poison statues, while they are a frustrating obstacle, they reward the player for playing smart, playing safe. As long as you're clearing in a manner that doesn't put you at risk, you honestly have nothing to complain about these statues. If you're using your torch, or better yet, if you're smart enough to equip a long range weapon in order to swing at them from completely outside of the range, like I said, the pike or the whip are really great examples of weapons you can use for that. It's a complete non-issue. Like, if the player is complaining about being in range of those statues and getting poisoned all the time, it's because they're not playing smart enough to avoid the damage. They're not playing smart enough to avoid getting hit. This is one of the areas in the gutter that really recommends it to me, this very missable secret area. This is a very difficult area to find your first time through, but if you do find it, you can actually head on through and get a bunch of really neat drops. Uh, it is a little bit frustrating that certain things are locked away in there, and that minor drops can fall through the floor. If you're just uh, clearing through enemies, the floor isn't actually a solid mesh like you would imagine most levels would be. It actually is what it looks like as represented by these boards. If one of the enemies drops would fall in between some of those boards, it will actually fall into the floor and become unobtainable. Which, while is a really cool uh, mechanic and adds a lot to the gameplay in that it incentivizes you to pick up the drop as soon as it pops up, otherwise you could lose it forever. It also is a little bit frustrating just from a gameplay perspective. Like, there is a little bit of a middle ground to be had between making interesting mechanics and making fun gameplay. They're not always the same thing, and that's what the gutter really fails to understand, is that just because it is an interesting and in-depth game mechanic doesn't mean you want to put it in your game. It's not necessarily going to add to the game intrinsically. Sometimes it's just a bad decision, and you should try and steer away from it, even though it will increase the complexity of the game. More pots with loot that I do approve of. That's another plus adding onto the side of the... Oh, don't want to go up there. Adding onto the side of the gutter, so... Again, I, I am a bit hypercritical at times, but that's just because I see its potential, and I see all that it could be, and I want it to be that little bit better, just because I like it so much already. But in the end, I can't really say that it's one of the better levels all around. Dark Souls 1 still has the best level design by far, though. They did come a long way in improving Dark Souls 2 level design when they made the DLC. Like, I was very impressed with the DLC, and uh, depending upon my decision-making at the time that we make it to the Rotten, I might actually head down through the DLC on this character for you all. Still making a decision on that. Haven't come to anything solid just yet. Nope. Roll out of this. That multi-head attack, too. So, oh my god taking so much damage, and I had him locked in stunlock the entire time. First I rolled through his attack, and he still got the damage off, and then I stunned him, and yet I was still taking damage. It's so frustrating. So very, very annoying. But yes, the DLC, which actually comes into play right at the end of, <laughs> you guessed it, the gutter. Uh, down at the bottom of Black Gulch, the you're finally going to be confronted with the option of heading down into the DLC area. And, quite honestly, I'd be interested to see how my character is going to fare. It's a little bit tricky. I'm going to probably have to play hit and run here. Because there's no way I can get up close enough to... Uh, can I? Yes. Because I had to light the torch, of course. But, at the same time, I didn't want to die, so... I had to play a little bit footloose with him. There we go. There is a another collapsing platform right there that I'm going to avoid. Come on over here. Again, just want to light up all the torches, grab all the loot I can. But at the end of this, when we get down through Black Gulch and have beaten the Rotten, 
that's when I'm going to be finally faced with the decision of enter the DLC or not. Uh, I'm, I am going to leave that off for now just because I want to have that decision waiting for me in the moment, but you know, that could be very interesting. It would give me a lot of really great things to talk about as well as giving me a chance to clear through it on a much lower level character. The first time that I actually cleared through the DLC, and I've only done it once, mind you, was on a character that had beaten its way all the way up to the, uh, what you call it, the Ancient Dragon, because I had heard somewhere that you needed the Ashen Mist Heart to get the full story of the DLC. And while that is technically true, it wasn't true in the manner that I thought it would be, so I really overleveled my character for the content. And while it does, the content does scale with your character, it doesn't do so in as noticeable a manner. More use for this, these hexing urns that we grabbed. There's just so many times when that little bit of throwing projectile comes in handy. This is another thing that frustrates me, is that by the time they give you a bonfire, you've basically beaten the gutter. Uh, there, there were several areas earlier, like maybe at the end of the zip line, or at the end of one of the loot paths that you could place a bonfire, where it would be very sensical and worthwhile to the player. But the way they set it up is right as you come to the end of the gutter, there's just a few more falling drops left and you're out of the gutter and into Black Gulch, now you get a bonfire. It's just... Huh. I don't know why they would make that decision, because I don't agree with it from a design perspective. I think that if you're going to give the player a bonfire, make it after they've done a fair portion of the level, and give it to them in a place right before the next challenging section. Oh, no way to avoid the damage there. That's nice. If I use the strong attacks, even one-handed, I can get this dagger. I didn't know that earlier, but it's good to make note of. Not that I'm going to be facing them much more until all Aldeus Keep, but, you know, it's always something to keep in mind. This was a weird enemy, and I'm still not sure why they put it in there, but it is a bit, little bit of cool flavor. Like, it really brings to life the ideas of... Uh... Jugo and the desert lands surrounded by massive ants. I'm of two minds about this encounter just because, I mean, it's a bunch of great loot. There's some poison moss for the black golds, which you're going to absolutely need. But this is such a strange and really nonsensical encounter that I don't really know why they put it in there. It seems very tacked on. Like, they weren't thinking about what they were doing when they just slapped it in there. There may have been other plans for the ant. Maybe it was a little bit more crucial to clearing through the, lever the level in a proper manner, or maybe it had some extra mechanic that didn't make it into the full game, but as it stands, it doesn't really make sense for why it's there. Like, there's, there's no reason for that ant to be there other than, oh, look, this is something cool that is going to take people a bunch of collaboration to really figure out what does, and while that's cool, I, I really do like that. I think that's one of the best parts of the Souls games. I don't understand why the designers would put it in there on its own. Like, it, it has no real place just to kind of be there. Get him out of the way. I do like that they actually made ladder combat viable. Like, before it was just see whose stamina ran out first, but now ladder combat actually does damage. Well, again, not a lot. It is it is damage, and it shouldn't be scoffed at by any stretch. Dark Souls 1 had ladder combat, but it, it was just see who could push each other off the ladder first, and now it actually adds something to the combat. It's something to think about. If you're going to be kiting up to a ladder, not only are you risking being completely immobile versus ranged attacks, but you're also setting your... Oh! <laughs> Apparently, you can get all of those in a single hit if you aim it properly. But you're locking yourself down if they have any sort of range attack. But now it also gives you the advantage in that you're now the first one who's able to respond should they try to chase you up the ladder. Whereas the only... or down the ladder. Whereas in Dark Souls 1, the only uh, real choice there was whether or not 
to get on the ladder and slide all the way down, or get on the ladder and try and bait them up so that you could just butt slide them several times and kind of lock them out for a little bit. And now we are in Black Gulch. Repair my weapons. I'm not going to bother spending these souls just yet, just because it's not quite enough to do anything worthwhile with. I do need to find where I... yes. It doesn't matter if you have the stats to wield the weapon in your left hand, so long as you have the range with it. I prefer the pike. I know a lot of people use the whip, but the pike is a little bit better in my opinion just for the very straight moveset. It's very easy to aim, though the sprinting attack of the whip is actually incredibly useful as well. If you want to just get in there and make sure the statues get out of your way. Because it strikes in a very large area, as opposed to the pike, which only has the very frontal attacks. Just wanted to make sure that was dead. Something a little tricky that they do is in higher bonfire intensities, they actually add a few of these hand enemies. So you're, you're not quite prepared for how many enemies you're going to be facing and where exactly they're going to be popping up at you. Which is nice, because one of the complaints that I have about the new game cycle system in general is the fact that it doesn't really add any intrinsic difficulty to the game. It's just making the enemies a little bit stronger, which isn't a good way to increase the difficulty of your game. Oh, did that really? Oh, that's, that's not good. I'm going to have to use the... That is one of the other things about the pike, is that it doesn't have a very... I mean, it is a much heavier weapon than the whip. So that's another thing you could chalk up in favor of the whip. But, uh... As I was saying, just increasing the health and damage numbers of the enemies isn't a really good way to increase the difficulty. A lot of games do that, and that's why a lot of games aren't souls. That's why Souls rises above the rest so entirely, in my opinion, because it does things different. It improves upon the systems that other games have used for so long. It makes them better. The combat in Souls is just always so rewarding, no matter what, that I really can't imagine why more games haven't chosen to adapt. I mean, I understand that it makes a game harder, when you have the more complex systems like this. But at the same time, you can clearly see the massive following that Dark Souls has got. This is something that people are looking for. Not just difficulty for the sake of difficulty, but really smart difficulty that plays off of how the player is going to interact with the level. That really challenges the developers to make a very interesting and in-depth game. And I guess if I'm being entirely honest, I do understand why more people don't create games like Dark Souls, because it does take a very in-depth knowledge of how the player works and the psychology behind what they're doing. Like, something you'll see FromSoft constantly do is give you little bits of trash loot, and while, like, a life gem here, or just a singular flame butterfly, not like with Najka. That one's that's just annoying. Don't don't get me started on that. I, I'm telling you, it's so frustrating for me because I have such an affinity for loot. It's just really really terrible. But as I was saying, they give you little bits of trash loot here and there, like a life gem or a flame butterfly. And what you eventually come to understand if you play the games for long enough is that they're not giving you that loot because you necessarily need a flame butterfly or one life gem is going to make the difference between life and death in this one area. They're giving it to you to draw your attention, to manipulate your camera. Dark Souls is about not only playing a very difficult game that is always fair, it's about pitting the developers versus the players. The developers are constantly thinking up ways to control and manipulate the player into falling for a certain ambush or uh, entering an encounter in a certain way. And then, if you as the player manage to fight against that and play smart, play careful, and come out triumphant, 
it's that much ro more rewarding because you're really realizing you came up against the developers and came out ahead. It's not a matter of, hey, I beat this AI. It's a matter of, I matched my own wits and skills against the level designed by these uh, developers, and I managed to beat it. And that's what's so rewarding about the Souls games in the end. That's what I think it really comes down to, is that it's more than just mashing your face into a difficult game until you finally come out ahead. It's coming to understand why the game is built a certain way and coming to surpass it, even though it is designed from the get-go to take advantage of your natural reactions and kill you for them. Like, several areas you'll come into a level and you'll see a single drop just waiting there on the floor. And if you follow your immediate gamer instincts and rush up to it and grab it and see what kind of loot you have, you'll immediately be ambushed. Oh, forgot about those. You'll immediately be ambushed and damaged by whatever enemy they had set up to guard that bit of loot that is poised to attack should you try to gather that bit of loot. And in a very similar way, they're always manipulating you. They're thinking about how can they get the player to walk into this trap or face these enemies a certain way. And that's why Dark Souls is such a masterwork, even, even when it doesn't have uh, Miyazaki working on it, which made the story suffer a bit, I'm going to be honest. The lore in Dark Souls 2 isn't quite the opus that it was in Dark Souls 1. I think Dark Souls 1 is still the better game from a story perspective, even though they improved a lot of the combat and made the game a little bit better from that aspect here in Dark Souls 2. There's so much to be said for all three of the Souls games, really. I think that uh, Demon Souls even has its own place. I think Demon Souls has the best atmosphere. It makes you feel the, the world the most because they uh, are allowed to create each individual level as its own little sub-world. They can really set it up as a very incredibly unique level with its own sorts of unique enemies and traps and little intricacies like certain falling puzzles or very, very linear uh, maze-like gameplay. And in a more cohesive game like Dark Souls or Dark Souls 2, you can't quite have that fine level of control over the entire level. Things kind of have to fit together and reuse assets a little bit more unlike in Demon's Souls, and so I do think that Demon's Souls has a better... hitboxes on this are ridiculous. I think it has a better atmosphere and uh, level aesthetic, if not design, because I do think that Dark Souls 1 has the best level design out of the entire series of Souls games. I know they're not technically a franchise, but they may as well be. Since I'm going off on a little bit of an offshoot, let me just talk about these giants real quick. They're an incredibly evil encounter, so if you have the option, th poison throwing knives are your best decision. They're going to be such a worthwhile por uh, purchase when you finally make it here, because not only are the roll timings incredibly weird, but the hitboxes are just absolutely massive. They can hit behind themselves when they're attacking forward. They can cover each other's blind sides. There's so much just horribly, horribly wrong with that encounter from uh, a fairness perspective, just because they added two giants, that I think any sorts of strategies you can take to make that encounter a little bit easier are perfectly justified. Like, I do think that most of the game is meant to be played in melee. It's supposed to... That's where most of the challenge comes from and how most of the encounters are balanced. But some of them are just incredibly unfair, like that one right there. But, you know, that is an entirely optional encounter. It doesn't give you anything you need for the story. It just makes the Vendrick fight slightly easier and gives you access to some secret loot and a secret covenant. So, 
I'm not going to chew the devs out for making it so ridiculously unfair just because, again, it's it's not a mandatory part of the game. If you are going to give the players a really side-shoot mission like this, then I think it's fair just to kind of up the ante, especially because there are ways to cheese that encounter. You can just go through and throwing knife them to death, as you just saw. And once you do that, you gain access to several really good items. Of course, Havel's armor, which, again, got a little bit of a nerf and a little bit of a buff at the same time, depending upon how you're using it in PvP, so... I don't know, I still think it's a worthwhile set, and I think that it's actually in a much better place now. Oh! Ow, oh, bollocks. I forgot that Homeward Bones actually do reset the uh, statues. So I guess it's a good thing that I was coming right here to the boss then. Uh, yeah. Coming in for the Rotten finally. Just going to buff my weapon to get that much more damage out of it. I am going to be using the axe for this because I want to be able to come at the boss from either side. I found that the two-handed mace move set, while it is so wonderful for bosses, it only really works if the enemy is to your left, because it has that very high ch Oh. I want to get him off the coals real quick, because I can't really fight in melee there. Uh, because the moveset always comes out on your left side, it has an incredibly good chance of completely whiffing if you're trying to use unlock combat from the right-hand side of the boss. So, always come in like this. Oh! And you can see, it's just my natural uh, instinct at this point to circle round to my right-hand side rather than the bosses, just because I'm so used to the mace. And I don't think it would have made too much of a difference, but now I've embraced the final great soul. I have all these souls to enter the Shrine of Winter, and that's going to be the episode. You know what? We are here. This is as close to a uh, blind run as the DLC as I can really give you at this point. Why not? Let's do it. I am going to at least make sure to light the primal bonfire and grab that sublime bone dust, but yeah, let's head in. There's a few lore things that I really want to clear up because there's a lot of theories flying around right now, and I want to get my ideas out there and on paper as fast as possible just to kind of cement my first impressions, even if my opinion grows from this point, which it undoubtedly will. Like, there's always wonderful lore tidbits and theories that I'm becoming acquainted with and are passing uh, my way and I'm hearing and growing my own theories based off of all the time, so it's nice to have a little bit of a record of where your ideas have been and where they're going. I did skip out on reading the pillars that surround the uh, first little section, but they don't have anything too terribly important. They're just a bit of flavor text for you. It is a very cool and atmospheric entrance to the level. It acquaints you with the fact that there's going to be bright glowing stones. It gives you a feel for the sort of architecture you can be expecting. It gives you the idea that this is all going to be underground. It's, it is a really wonderful way of introducing the level. It even shows you off some of the more insectile sections and the cobwebs and the little holes that can be found that are going to be really pervasive. If you remember the comments I was making about the Great Shield, the Old Knight Great Shield, this should be where you start thinking about that again. Look at the architecture here. Remind you of any ancient civilizations? Yes? I thought so. Oh, welcome to the big bad of the DLC. This wonderful guy. And yes, that is actually a spear skewering him right through. My first time through, I only noticed the prong sticking out of his chest and thought it was a rather awkward stone protrusion, but no, that is, that is a spear that's pierced him through and through. And as we'll come to see, a bit of the cause for all the ills of this city. I'm just going to tease you with that as we head back to Majula and spend some of these levels. Probably going to want to increase my vitality some so that I can he handle this incredibly heavy armor. Because 
I, I did equip it all while I, off camera, so I didn't get the chance to show you. But as you can see, this weighs 15, while the Falconer set weighs 7.7. .7. That's almost double the weight. It's an incredible jump. But at the same time, it's also a massive leap in defenses. Like, that's almost four times as much defense. <laughs> Not four times. Three times as much physical defenses as the uh, Falconer armor. In fact, more so, depending upon the actual defense. And that's plus one even, so... It is a vast improvement, and also the poise value is much, much greater. So, it is a big improvement, but I also tacked on the helmet, which I didn't have the Falconer's helmet. So that's all that much extra weight that I wasn't <laughs> carrying around before. So, I'm going to want to increase my vitality some, just to make sure that I can keep up the lighter rolls that I've been used to. Let's get that to 16. Grade my vitality sum. Because again, I do need to be focusing on increasing my uh, dexterity, just so that when I get to the Shrine of Amana, I can be sure to grab the Red Iron Twin Blade. But that'll be all for this episode. Thank you so much for watching. Leave any comments or feedback down below. And have a good day.